Good morning, everyone. Time to begin our 8 a.m. press conference, the first of four today. This one we're calling Mummified Arctic Forest Provides Clues of Dramatic Climate Change. And we'll have one speaker, Joel Barker, who's a research scientist at the School of Earth Sciences at The Ohio State University in Columbus. Thanks very much, and thanks for um, attending my talk. Uh, it's comforting to know that there are people who share my interest in this. Um, sorry? Sure, I'll talk more into the mic. Okay. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of, of course, myself, but also Dr. Yo Chin and Dr. David Elliott, also affiliated with the Bird Polar Research Center at The Ohio State University. Um, it's by no accident that the uh, title slide has no uh, plant material in it uh, because this is the environment that's up there right now, uh, characterized by bare rock and glaciers and snow cover. Um, we're going to present evidence uh, here that this was not always the case. Okay. Um, I'd originally formatted this as a keynote, so the transitions might be a bit slow in its current form, so please bear with me. Um, this is just a slide to show you what we're talking about, where we're talking about. Uh, this is Greenland, of course. This is North America. And this island up here is Ellesmere Island. Specifically, we're in the northernmost part of Ellesmere Island in a national park called Katinerpak National Park. And don't worry, I'll, I'll show you how to spell that on the last slide. Tinner Pack National Park is really a jewel in the crown of the national park system in Canada. Um, amongst other things, it's home to the largest body of fresh water in, uh, in the Arctic Circle. And this is w where I was when I heard about this wood that people had found. Um, I was doing my postdoctoral research work uh, with Dr. Vince St. Louis at the University of Alberta, and we were stationed here. Um, the park wardens there, they, they sort of know everything that's going on. It's their own little environment. They're very familiar with what's going on. So we were talking one night and uh, asked what I did. I explained what I did. And he said, oh, it's, it's a weird thing. We found uh, wood, logs, over at a site. And so I thought that was interesting. Maybe, maybe we could go take a look. And we, we did. Um, on the way in the helicopter, we flew over landscapes like this, which is pretty characteristic of the environment we're working in. You can see it's just bare rock, ice. Uh, where there's sufficient water, you get the growth of grasses. Um, this is sort of a close-up. You've got musk oxen up there. Again, just bare rock, very limited vegetation. Uh, I'm sorry, that one's a bit underexposed on this display, but that's the conspicuous absence of trees is what I'm trying to get across here. Um, the only woody plant material in this environment is really these dwarf willows that grow to a height of no more than five centimeters above ground, and they sort of spread laterally. This is an environment that's characterized as a polar desert, so very low moisture. Uh, wintertime temperatures can get as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius and remain that way for a month. So really, um, when we think of forests, this is not the environment that you'd think of. So this is sort of the material that the parks people had, uh, had found, um, just laying around the landscape. And when we got to this site, this was in 2008, um, we sort of flew there. Uh, I was with the park warden and a colleague. Uh, we landed, the helicopter pilot told us we had 30 minutes on the ground. So we jumped out and just ran, 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 ended up taking, taking uh, 45 minutes. The helicopter pilot was not really happy about that, but we collected samples. Uh, the intent was just to f find out what type of wood this was. We knew it was special, but we just wanted to get an idea of what was going on. Um, so in the meantime, I um, went back. I found out that there had been other researchers that had been there who had also been taken to this site. Uh, this is uh, Robert Blanchett and Joel Jurgens from Minnesota, uh, the university there. Um, they had collected the wood that was sort of strewn around, and they had looked at sort of how fungi were degrading it, but also they had um, provided a, a, a taxonomic inventory. And the thing that really jumped out, they published this paper, and I can provide you with a PDF of that paper if you want. The thing that struck out, that really jumps out at you is there's very low species diversity. Um, and I'll get into that when I start talking about specific results. 
at any rate, we went back um, again working on this unrelated project uh, in 2009, went back to this site and actually found a very, very rich deposit, much more densely um, populated by these woody macro fossils than anywhere else. Uh, they weren't scattered around, they were actually in a cliff face that had been uh, eroded by a river. So this was quite a find, um, quite fortunate. Um, I just sort of was walking up valley and uh, the frequency of this wood got bigger and bigger until I rounded a corner and this jumped down at me. Um, this, again, I'm sorry it's unexposed. I'd be happy to provide you with uh, the, the, the J uh, JPEGs of this, but there's a tree that is longer than the shovel for scale, uh, leaning up against there. Here we've got just, it looks like, um, almost like you'd expect in a modern day river, uh, maybe some gently moving water just piled up all this wood, uh, high density of wood. This is a, a cross section of a tree. Um, you can see a finger there for scale. It's not much more than say four centimeters across, but just by counting the tree rings in a very crude manner, not doing it properly like the dendrochronologists do, um, just crudely counting the tree rings. We've got a minimum age of 75 years. So what we're looking at here is an old tree, but the conditions were absolutely brutal if you're a tree. Okay, It's not putting up a lot of biomass every year. Um, so very hard living conditions um, indicated by the density of these tree rings, but also the very low species diversity. Uh, we went back, uh, applied for an eager grant, and I'll, it's an acronym, uh, the NSF, they've always got acronyms, and I'll, I'll tell you later on what that acronym is. We received an eager grant to go up and really characterize this site properly, because up to this point it had just been flights of opportunity, we were lucky to find this site. Now we really wanted to get to the meat of the matter, so we started poking around. We found a soil that was associated with this forest, and once you start digging into the soil, these leaves are not uncommon. And it's not just fossilized leaves. These aren't fossils. These are actually leaves. And you can see here a bit of a leaf sticking out from the surrounding soil, uh, just a finger there for scale. So these are like leaves if you went, maybe not in California, but definitely in Ohio, if you went for a walk in the late fall. They don't look much different than that. Um, so ongoing work, we're trying to identify what species these come from. Um, other things we found in poking through the soil under a microscope are these little things are called catkins and what they are is on a birch tree they have cones and so these are pretty much the equivalent of a scale on a cone but from a birch tree and um, collaborating with uh, Jurgens and Blanchett from Minnesota um, they want to really start looking at the seeds and getting at the DNA um, try to get some sort of evolutionary story um, we know from the existing literature and I'll get into this a bit later um, that the high Arctic didn't have trees in it um, anything younger than the tertiary. So right off the bat, we know that these things are older than the tertiary, so we know that they're at least older than two million years, and I'll constrain that a bit as we go along. This, again, is just an example of some of the things we're finding. Um, as we, we brought soil samples back to the lab, as we're picking through them, we're finding seeds, hoping to find some insects, um, that sort of thing. So. Um, a question that frequently comes up, well, what's the difference between mummified and petrified? Okay, I've reported these as mummified tree remains. Mummified is what you, just like if we're talking about a mummy in, say, Egypt, okay? It's just desiccated. Um, I accidentally, I tried to, to dry these, uh, a wood sample in a furnace. I set the temperature too high and it caught fire. So these are at least two million year old tree remains that are still combustible, okay? As opposed to petrified, which is basically when, when groundwater will circulate through a rock, or a, I'm sorry, a, a, a piece of wood, and as it does so, it deposits any minerals that are in the water, and that mineral matrix slowly takes over what the wood was. So in fact, the, the wood turns into a rock. So not combustible, really it's more rock than wood. You're left with the structure. You can make out that it's definitely wood. You can see things like xylem and phloem and that sort of thing, but uh, if you're a microbe, you couldn't eat it. Uh, you definitely couldn't burn it. It's definitely rock. So we're dealing here, all these remains are mummified. Now, mummified forest sites are not that uncommon in the high Arctic. This is a pretty comprehensive map for the Arctic archipelago. And you can see there's quite a few. Uh, there's one even farther north in Greenland. What's unique about our site is that, first of all, it's the farthest north in Canada. 
But the species diversity, it being so low, that's really the key here. So the evidence of the really, really harsh environment, the species diversity in all these other sites is quite high. If you look at the reports, um, look at the pollen like we did, um, it's pages. Um, so you're looking, you're dealing with these sites, it's a well-populated forest, it's a healthy ecosystem. At our site, this is an ecosystem that's right on the edge. It's really struggling to survive. Uh, low species diversity, very low pollen diversity, so from that we know that there wasn't a lot of forest around that was much different than the one we're looking at here. So I think within that context, this is really a unique site. So I'm just going to skip to results, and I know these slides are pretty thick, so I'll just go through these. Um, some of this I've already said. So low pollen and, and macrofossil species diversity indicates that we've only got pine, spruce, birch, and larch. So it's a mixed deciduous forest, but again, I can't, I can't exp uh, stress this enough, the species diversity is just so abnormally low. This is an ecosystem that was on the decline, just barely struggling to keep going in this environment. Um, so this, um, again, uh, we've only got boreal type, so what you'd expect to find now in a sort of a taiga or boreal transitional forest, but this is at much higher latitudes. Very low growth rate, again suggesting that it's just a, an ecosystem that's just struggling to survive. We've got very well preserved, higher plant material, and it's in a low stage of degradation. So what this means is that I mean, this is a potential source of organic matter if you're a microbe or if you're a fungi. Uh, this is good stuff. This is stuff you can eat and metabolize. The paleosoil is also very, um, relatively rich in organic carbon for its age, at least 2 million years old. It's 4.5% organic carbon, which is in the neighborhood of what you'd find uh, in present-day ecosystems. You could definitely... Um, it's, it's definitely not, say, a desert. Um, it, it's reasonably rich in organic carbon. Uh, we sent some samples away for biomarker analysis, and the biomarker analysis sort of reinforces what we found with the uh, macrofossil species diversity, so uh, came back indicating that it's a mixed deciduous forest dominated by pine and spruce. Um, so we've got three lines of evidence to suggest that very low diversity, mixed boreal type ecosystem in that area. And I'm sorry, this is even grosser, but uh, we'll work our way through here. Um, in order to constrain the date, um, we can't radiocarbon date these things. Uh, they're too old, okay? They're radiocarbon dead. So we have to look at proxy evidence to try to really narrow down the age. And what I mean by proxy evidence is we look for other things that would characterize the area in a specific place in time, and by association, our environment was there as well. What jumps out at us is that we find no sign of metasequoia. Metasequoia is dawn redwood, and it was very prolific in the Canadian Arctic during the Eocene. There's a site on Axel Heiberg Island, a well-published site called Napertulik, also referred to as the Geodetic Hills, uh, very well published in the late 90s, um, just swimming in metasequoia. We find absolutely no evidence of metasequoia, and we find no evidence that this site predates the Eocene. So I think we're looking at mid to latest Miocene, at the very oldest, uh, no younger than two million years old. So we've constrained it within 10 million to two million years old. Um, again, the low species diversity and boreal type species composition and low growth rate suggest that the site existed in a very climatically stressed environment, perhaps near the northern extent of tree line. The deciduous forest ecosystem at Treeline would have been among the first to respond to climate cooling and the transition from greenhouse to ice house conditions in the Arctic. And I'll show you a short slide using other people's results just to, as an example of what I mean by that. But really, if you want to study climate transition, you want populations that are right at the edge of their survival because they're the ones that are going to really respond to smaller perturbations in climate. You don't want to sort of uh, look at something that's much farther south because there's so many species, each one is responding in its own way and there might be sort of symbiotic relationships happening. Up here where things are so stressed, any small perturbation in climate is going to have a marked effect. So our hope is that by looking at um, very high resolution, so annual to subannual, looking at the tree rings, looking at the chemistry of the tree rings, we can get an idea of what the climate was doing, how fast it was doing it, and how quickly the ecosystem was responding to that. OK, 
okay, and that's 0.4 here. Um, so looking at, say, stable isotopes of oxygen, that will give us an idea of temperature. Looking at stable isotopes of carbon will give us an idea of what the carbon cycle was doing on a global basis during this rapid change from greenhouse to ice house conditions. From that, we can sort of back extrapolate what might happen as the climate goes the other way. So if things are warming, how quickly could we expect the ecosystem up there to respond? What sort of thresholds are we looking at for a major change in vegetation, for a tree line migration farther north? These are questions that we hope to address in the upcoming uh, analyses. And again, um, and I don't want to stress this too much because it's, it's um, almost irresponsible of me to, to report this because we don't really have firm evidence to suggest that this will happen, but any time where you've got an organic rich substrate with a warming climate, this might um, increase microbial metabolism of this substrate to produce greenhouse gases. So, that's a potential offshoot, uh, offshoot of our research and something we're definitely going to look into. But at the point we're at now, we can't make any firm statements regarding that. Um, we can with number four there. So this is just a graph from uh, author Zakos and others. It was in Science in 2001. And this is based on things like marine sediment cores. They get an idea of what climate was doing in deep geological history. And so Here's the Miocene. So I said we're probably about 10 million years, um, no younger than two. So you can see here, this is a temperature curve. Uh, they measure temperature by looking at the stable isotopes of oxygen. And so you can see here's the axis for temperature here. And after the middle Miocene, that's when we get the transition from it being very warm up there to getting much cooler. And I think that's what our site is tracking. We're in here somewhere. Where, we're not quite sure yet but we know that climate is really hitting the fan for these guys and by uh, doing a really high resolution analysis, various geochemical proxies, we're hoping to understand how quickly it was happening, get an idea of what the carbon cycle and the water cycle were doing and how the ecosystem was responding to that change with the overall goal of being able to back extrapolate uh, and maybe make some predictive models of what the Arctic ecosystem will do in response to warming. Um, here I've got just a geologic time scale. I'd be happy to go back to it uh, for your reference. Um, here, and that's the acronym for the EAGER grant. So NSF is National Science Foundation, Early Concept Grants for Exploratory Research. That was really um, the thing that allowed us to go up and look at this site in detail. Uh, without this grant, uh, none of this would have been possible, and we're thankful to the NSF for having such a great program that permits this type of research. And that's how you spell Katinerpak. It's an Innu word. I think it means something land up there. Uh, Katinerpak National Park. Um, that's all I really have for the presentation. Thank you for your attention. I'd be open to questions. I'm Ned Rosell. I write a newspaper column in Alaska, and I wonder, what do you think preserved this wood and those leaves for that long? Um, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Um, how how was this wood preserved for that long, like two that, million years? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, basically, you've got to cut off the oxygen, and you've got to limit moisture because microbes that degrade this material um, definitely need moisture, all organisms on Earth do, and um, oxygen is a really good oxidizing agent, I mean, as the name suggests. So basically, you bury this stuff in a, uh, quickly, and you keep it dry, which is perfect for a, a tundra desert ecosystem. Um, if it had remained open, it would have degraded completely, and if there had been sufficient water, it would have degraded completely. What about the exposed wood that the park rangers first saw? Yeah, so another good question, and it's a bit of an enigma, that stuff. Um, we don't know when it was exposed. Um, we think that during the Little Ice Age, or the last glaciation in the Holocene, that the area was likely covered with glaciers. And so maybe all of this stuff was buried at one point, and then these glaciers moved through and exposed it. So the wood down at the, the head of the valley that the rangers are finding, 
that might have only been exposed since the 1800s or maybe 1600 years. And so in the environment like we have, again, it's still dry, obviously open to the atmosphere, so you've got oxygen. But that stuff's more than, I mean, we know it's degrading quicker than the stuff that was buried and has been exposed and the stuff we're digging out. So I don't know if that answers your question, if that's what you were looking for, but yeah, it's, it's definitely in a more advanced stage of degradation than the stuff that we're uncovering. You don't find leaves out in the open atmosphere. Uh, Boston Hunt, The Economist. Um, I came in a bit late, so I'm, I apologize if you're, you've already covered this, but uh, could you give me a sense of the history of this, of this spot? Um, is, uh, was it once a, a nice forest, then it became a very struggling <laughs> ecosystem, and that's what you see? Or was it once uh, totally uninhabited, un uninhabited, and did it become just livable for a while, and, and, and then again uh, not? And it's I'm, a asking, I'm asking because um, you say you, you, you don't find uh, remnants of any other uh, kinds of trees. Um, uh, you can't find them, or uh, are you pretty sure they never were there? That's a good question. Um, it's a difficult one to answer because this site's been exposed, and obviously, I mean, with stratigraphy, you've got all the older stuff is lower down, and the stuff gets laid progressively on top of it. This is a highly dissected landscape by glaciers. Uh, the geologic maps, all the yunk crops are sort of Jurassic in age, and that's where we're finding this petrified wood. So we know that going as far back into the Jurassic that this site had forests in it, and I think it would be a reasonable assumption to suggest that throughout, and I hope I can, yeah, uh, looking at this curve, um, it doesn't go back to the Jurassic, but you can see that climate was very favorable in here. It was quite warm. So I think it would be reasonable to expect that there was continuous forest at this latitude, um, it's just either been eroded away or is still deeply buried, uh, waiting to be discovered. Um, I know in the press release, uh, Dr. Elliott makes a very good point um, that this landscape is just so huge. Um, I'm sure that if we looked around, uh, other researchers, anyone, looked around, we'd find more of these sites. Um, I think the opportunity is definitely there. I think we were just lucky to find this one. Uh, Harvey Lyford, Freelance. Uh, first, uh, I would just like to verify that the Kachinir Park, Park is the same place as described in the press release as Ellesmere Island National Park. It's the very same. Uh, it was renamed um, relatively recently just due to uh, political reasons, really. Um, it's sort of a joint management between the, uh, the territory of Nunavut, which is all um, Inuk. Um, so they renamed the park to an Inuk name. And this is in Nunavut? Nunavut, yeah. Um, okay, if you can leave it on three, um, back down to number three. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, I get the greenhouse conditions, but the ice house, how do you define that? And then your, if you could expand a little on your last point, which uh, I sort of missed because I was writing down the previous one. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I zoomed through those. Um, well, when we talk about greenhouse, I mean, we're talking about climate warming. Uh, a warm climate due to greenhouse gases. And definitely, I mean, if you look at the, the paleoclimate maps for this area, the continents were in different locations. Um, it just so happens that Ellesmere Island was pretty much at the same high latitude. It just sort of shifted a bit. But back sort of beyond the Eocene, where we really had the warming there, we had no Arctic Ocean. We had widespread tectonism. So we had continental rifting, lots of volcanoes, lots of release of CO2 which sort of fed back into climate and warmed things up. How I would define ice house now is that decreasing temperature to the present. So you would characterize current conditions, or at least conditions prior to, I guess, 2007, uh, as ice house. As climate warms, I guess we're starting to get towards the more greenhouse end member. And uh, to address your question about number five, um, I mean, Microbes, fungi, uh, heterotrophic organisms, us, uh, we need organic carbon as a substrate uh, to carry out metabolic processes. And so if you've got a rich deposit, um, maybe now it's buried, it's definitely lodged in permafrost, and I'm sure you've heard about this before, especially in Alaska, it's a big concern. With permafrost melt, it's exposing all of this organic matter that had previously been sequestered. And so, obviously, we've got a very rich um, uh, soil. It's got high organic matter. Uh, we've got forest remnants, leaves, wood. Um, 
that sort of thing. We've got accessible organic matter. If things warm, it's being released, it might serve as a substrate for these microorganisms. And a, a, a byproduct of metabolism is CO2. As we respire, we're respiring CO2. And in the absence of oxygen, it's methane. But as David Elliott points out in the press release, this site alone, I mean, you, you put this one to shame by driving your car home. Um, this is really a small site. But again, looking around the Arctic, uh, these things might be widespread, and so it might in the future become a more and more important source of organic matter. We have a question from a reporter watching on the webcast. Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today would like to know if you could explain what the leaves are like when they are mummified. Can they be picked up, or are they part of the soil or rock or whatever they're in? No, they can be picked up. They're pretty fragile, um, but uh, there's a, oops. Sorry. Um, I just want to get to the one picture. So you can see here that the leaf is actually extending beyond the background of the soil clump. So this is actual leaf tissue. Um, something we're very interested in. Um, if we've got tissue, we might have other uh, things that would be useful, such as DNA, um, that sort of thing. Uh, we're hoping to open up that line of investigation. Uh, hi, uh, Charles. Jonathan Amos from BBC News. So we think these then are, what, the last trees to exist up there um, before the region went into the cold period that we're currently in, and none of the warm pulses, the interglacials, the Emian, uh, would have got warm enough to, to reestablish um, um, forested growth in, uh, in this area. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. We know that there were no forests up in Arctic Canada um, after the tertiary. So if we're looking at our geologic map uh, time scale. Oh, sorry, I went the wrong line. Bear with me. And we know this um, from looking at uh, sediment cores, things like that. So if there were forests, you'd expect to find pollen or organic remains. And so we know that there's nothing um, beyond the tertiary. And here's the tertiary here. It ends sort of at the end of the Pliocene. So yeah, these, these were sort of, I beg your pardon? Yeah, two million, yeah. I'm sorry, that's the scale right here. So there's five, so we're up at two. So we know that uh, forests of this type disappeared. There was nothing there. So this, we believe, is the northernmost site found. Um, there should be others out there. But so far, this, this is the one that would have been right at the, the tree line. As things were deteriorating, this was sort of the last end member, I guess. Yeah. We have another question from a reporter online, Van Ute Kesse from a German publication would like to know, how big were the trees, and do you have any idea at which precise time the forest lived? Are there any more constraints? Could it have been at the end of the Pliocene, for example, when the ice sheets started to grow? It's a good question. Um, we hope to address the issue of where it was relative to the ice sheets. Um, if we look at the stable oxygen isotopes, that should tell us. Um, the largest tree that we found, uh, I mean, these are things that have obviously been broken off. Um, we don't find complete trees. So the largest stump we found was that one that I showed not very effectively um, that's about as long as a shovel, uh, probably about that wide. Um, that's the one we're going to target to look at um, individual tree rings. So we'll take uh, a core from right near the center, so at its youngest wood, and we'll compare it to the wood at the outer uh, radius of the tree. So we'll compare how oxygen has changed over that time interval. We'll compare how car atmospheric carbon has changed over that time interval. And from that, we should get an idea of what the hydrologic cycle was doing at that point and what the global carbon cycle was doing at that point. Uh, yes, uh, Anne Rosenthal, SF Nature. Uh, you showed a map um, with locations of other mummified forests in Arctic Canada and in Greenland, I believe. And I was wondering if there are other mummified forests that have been found, for example, in uh, Russia or you know, uh, the Nordic countries. Um, and in addition, I'm wondering, is this something that's pretty much um, 
limited to high uh, northern uh, latitudes um, just because you, of the sort of freeze-dried nature of the place and perhaps um, locations further, uh, further south don't contain or wouldn't contain mummified uh, remains? Um, I think anywhere on the planet where you would have the ability to isolate organic remains from oxygen and water, you could get a deposit like this. And I think I've, I've read of similar deposits in uh, the Florida Keys, for example. Um, so this is stuff that was buried quickly, I guess. I mean, you're not isolating it from water, but um, certainly uh, water circulation through that would be limited, and so you're not going to permineralize it or turn it into petrified wood. Uh, you're definitely isolating it from oxygen, so it wouldn't degrade. But I think those remains are much younger. Uh, I know in Norway they have found mummified trees, but again, they're much younger. I think they're sort of pre-last um, pre glacial maximum trees, so we're talking of thousands, tens of thousands of years rather than millions. Um, the Russian question is a good one. Uh, I haven't read anything, but literature is difficult to access, Russian literature. Um, I know, I mean, you've probably all heard of the mammoths that they find there. I haven't heard any reports of fossil forests. But again, I mean, the mammoth reports are also younger than what we're hypothesizing here. Any other questions? What specific research were you doing when you heard about these trees? Yeah, it was totally unrelated. Um, I did a postdoc at the U of A uh, looking at net ecosystem exchange from the tundra. So I was looking at um, the, 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 um, basically how the tundra breathes. So is it a source of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere or is the tundra being uh, a sink? And this um, ties into, if you're from Alaska, you've heard about this, that everyone's in a panic because of permafrost is melting and exposing this organic matter, it's decaying, producing greenhouse gases. So we were up there to see, so if we go to the farthest north tundra, um, set up an eddy covariance flux tower, monitor this thing at very high resolution, what is the tundra in this environment doing? And um, I don't want to give away the secret because we're hoping to publish it, but uh, found some cool results anyway. So it is, I mean, these were a very rewarding few years for me anyway. Anyone yes. else? I think we have a question up there. Oh. It's a source of greenhouse gases and not a sink. I, I would suggest it's not as un unambiguous as, as oh, one might think. <laughs> and I'd be happy to send you the manuscript after it gets accepted. <laughs> okay, our next press conference will be at 9 o'clock on the uh, last Arctic refuge. <laughs>